Um, so in this talk today, I, I'd like to share um, some stories from my travels, but also give you some background information on the biogeography of these amazing insects, which you can find here in Australia and in New Guinea. Um, and before I start, I have a couple of people to thank because this was really exceptional. Um, going to New Guinea, I, I thought would not be possible for me, but uh, thankfully Dan Brown uh, came into contact with my photographs and, um, and then Aaron, of course, who is a co-owner of Heritage Expeditions, which is a New Zealand tour company, hired me. Um, to work as a guide for these trips, which went all the way from Raja Ampat in West Papua to the Solomon Islands. And we visited a lot of remote islands and were able to do so because we were uh, living on a, a very small fortified ice vessel. So this ship sails all the way from Russia to Antarctica. And um, I got to go to the, the beautiful places in between that big trip. So a, a little bit back, bit of background uh, about myself. I am a PhD student in entomology. I do spend a lot of my time in cabbage fields, um, mostly studying insect ecology to improve uh, how sustainable our pest management is. But my hobby interests are in insects in the wild and in what is native here in Australia. And I moved to Australia from the US because you guys have so many amazing insects and plants and other animals that they just, uh, they're totally strange and um, in, in many cases, pretty understudied. Um, so in this photo, you can see the Titan stick insects. So in between my hands is a stick and attached to the stick is the, the Titan female. So that is an insect that I found in my own backyard here in Brisbane and was able to raise it over a few months uh, from the length of my thumb to the length of my forearm. And I think that's quite an exceptional thing. I, I don't ever take it for, for granted. So um, considering Australia, we often think about it uh, today as this island of sorts. It's very isolated and distant, distant from um, most other areas. And we think of it as having really unique animals. Um, the one that comes to mind most often are probably the kangaroo, like this Eastern gray kangaroo. And when I came here, I, I landed in Cairns to do research with James Cook University. And what I learned while in Cairns is that uh, things get even stranger as you go into far north Queensland. So Australia is unique for the animals it has there. And I think Queensland is the unique of the unique. So your kangaroos have essentially gone to the trees. You can encounter a dinosaur. Um, in terms of the cassowary, and the insects are, are just as exceptional. But Australia hasn't always been so disconnected. It, is, uh, it shares a deep history with New Guinea, and this map to the right is actually a study on the migration patterns of indigenous Australians. So this, these date back up to 50,000 years um, to show how if you were around 50,000 years ago, you could walk from the Bird's Head Peninsula in Raja Ampat down to Hobart in Tasmania. Say if you, you, you had the energy for it, you could do that. And the habitats that were here um, have changed drastically over time. So what we see today is uh, just a, a little slice of what once was. Rainforests used to cover more of, of Queensland, for instance, and New Guinea and Queensland used to be more connected. But what we see today in terms of the animals, the cassowary, which you find in Queensland is the southern cassowary. There are even more species up in New Guinea. The birdwing butterflies that you can find in Cairns, like the Cairns birdwing, there are even more species in New Guinea. And this deep history is something I became increasingly um, more and more interested in as I um, studied the insects here in Australia. Um, and most people, when they think of New Guinea, they um, are interested in looking at the birds of paradise, which are really exceptional uh, animals. And for this expedition, that was a main goal, is to go out to these rainforests and see these different birds of paradise, like the Wilson's bird of paradise, which I was lucky to see, and the red bird of paradise displaying for their females. 
So in this photo, you can see the males are flying back and forth. They call all morning long um, from, from the, the very beginning of sunrise into nearly midday, these guys were going, all for the chance to secure a mate. But when we consider these amazing birds of paradise, I think just as equally we could consider the bird wings of paradise. So this is the can's bird wing. This is just the female, um, which is quite larger than the male. Um, but these bird wing butterflies are something that I found quite striking when I came here and are something that collectors hundreds of years ago really appreciated as well. So those cases that I'm holding were collected and compiled by Alfred Parkhurst Dodd, also known as the Butterfly Man of Coranda. Um, and that is his great, great granddaughter. Um, so she had all these old collections that they didn't want anymore. So um, these butterflies have been appreciated for um, probably since the first Australians came um, through and the first people arrived in New Guinea. And these bird wings of paradise are similarly exceptional because there are many different species. So there's estimated to be 36 species of different bird wing butterflies. Um, you can find them um, in Malaysia. There's the Trogonoptera brookiana or Raja Brooks bird wing, for instance, which is this top pair. The, the male is on the left and the female is on the right. Um, and then there's Troides or the golden underwing bird wing butterfly. But the true bird wings are the, those species which are in the genus Ornithoptera, which means bird wing, like Ornithoptera goliath here. And it is these butterflies that I'd like to emphasize because all bird wing butterflies are what we call sexually dimorphic, where the males are more colorful than the females in this case. Sexual dimorphism just means that the males and females physically look different. Um, but the exceptionally showy males that you see in Ornithoptera here, so in the, in the bottom right corner, you can see how the males are very bright green or bright blue, whereas in the Troides up at the top, they're not necessarily that much more vibrant or colorful compared to the females. And so it suggests that in the genus Ornithoptera, there is at least slight sexual selection so the females may be choosing more showier males, um, which is what we see with the birds of paradise and is possibly what has driven these really exaggerated dances, exaggerated, beautiful, crazy plumage, and uh, what, these wild behaviors that you've seen on David Attenborough documentaries. And we often use the, the males of these species to describe the species. So the females can be quite uniform in color, but the males are what stand out. And I think that's something that's really unique and insects can often be overlooked. Oh, sorry, every time I click this. Um, and similar to the coloration, the behaviors are there as well. So this is a video from a butterfly sanctuary of a male birdwing butterfly fluttering, dancing, over the female and he's doing two things. He is showing her his extravagant colors and dusting her with pheromones. It's like a bird of paradise in its dance. And the lucky male, yes, he did the trick. <laughs> so I encourage you to now think of these bird wings as the bird wings of paradise. <laughs> Um, and I was very lucky to see these uh, overseas. And so this is Tithonus birdwing, and I got to see this in the Arfak Mountains of West Papua. And similar to that Cairns birdwing female, it is large, it is beautiful, um, and it's such an exceptional creature. And it is the female butterflies um, of these species that are the largest, including the Queen Alexandra's birdwing. So the males are really showy, but the females are quite large. And the largest butterfly in the world um, measures to be 25 centimeters in, in wingspan. Um, but it's only found in a few places in Papua New Guinea um, and originally was documented uh, to the Western world in 1906 by Albert Meek, 
So there were several naturalists that were hired um, by William Rothschild and sent to New Guinea, which sounds like a, a bit of a dream job, just going to New Guinea and looking for insects to document them. Um, but it's also rumored that the first specimen of this butterfly was shot with a shotgun to be caught. And when you see these butterflies flying around, they resemble birds. They are huge. And I, I will say that I did not see this species because I did not travel to the Oro province of New Guinea. So don't be too jealous about me getting to go. Maybe you'll get to go and see this beautiful species. Because this species is, uh, after 60 uh, years of being described, um, it went, nearly went extinct. And that was mostly due to over collection. So I mentioned those collectors before that really appreciate these butterflies from different regions. But unfortunately, that appreciation can cross a line to where we over collect. And now this butterfly is um, listed as endangered and it's banned from trade. Um, and that is only one of three insects. So this butterfly, by being the largest in the world and by being collected, it's gained a lot of attention for what we need to do to protect insects. They do matter. They, they can, we can over collect them. They are under threat. Um, and so it's brought a lot of attention to consider that we need to use permits and we need to um, do special trade um, to protect uh, species from being over collected. And this insect farming, not only for this species, but for many others, um, not, and not just butterflies, but beetles as well, um, is estimated to bring in about 400,000 US dollars annually to Papua New Guinea, which is crazy. <laughs> I think that's quite exceptional. So one, we are able to take, um, moderate how insects are being traded or sold, but possibly encouraging conservation because you need those habitats for these insects to be there and there's an economic incentive. Um, so this is the male of the Tithonus birdwing from the Arfak Mountains. I have done nothing to change the colors of this photo. Um, this birdwing butterfly normally appears as green in real life, but you may see these yellows standing out because the colors on these butterflies is actually from scales. And so instead of being a pigment, the coloration is what we call structural coloration. So it's how light is reflecting off those scales. And so as you change angle, they can uh, appear to be a different color. So green to yellow. And you'll see that in some different uh, butterflies as well. Um, but if I haven't convinced you that birdwing butterflies are exceptional, um, I want to share this excerpt from Alfred Russell Wallace. So he was an early naturalist through New Guinea and Malaysia and Borneo. And his uh, explorations there documented many unique species for the first time, including that Raja Brooks birdwing, that national butterfly of Malaysia. And when he came across this, which is now called Wallace's golden birdwing, he said, the beauty and brilliancy of this insect are indescribable, and none but a naturalist can understand the intense excitement I experienced when I, at length, captured it. On taking it out of my net and opening the glorious wings, my heart began to beat violently. The blood rushed to my head, and I felt much more like fainting than I have done when an apprehension of immediate death. I had a headache the rest of the day. So great was the excitement produced by what will appear to most as a very inadequate cause. So my entire time through going to New Guinea and getting to see these butterflies in person, I felt like that. I read Wallace's, uh, I and many other naturalists have read Wallace's experiences in going through these areas and, and connected to it and realized that we're not alone in our appreciation for these amazing insects. And um, if you don't feel just that intense level of intensity, that's all right. Um, but hopefully you understand where I'm coming from in, in my excitement and enthusiasm for these insects. Um, so they continue to inspire many people today, um, including the Bougainville blue butterflies. Um, so these photographs are 
are likely to be some of the first ones of these in the wild alive. Um, so it, I don't know what, uh, what people have in other collections, but there's very few photographs of these butterflies in the wild. And the Bougainville blue um, comes from Bougainville Island, along with these amazing dragonflies that I saw everywhere. And if you're familiar with uh, Bougainville Island, you may have heard about the Panguna Mine run by Rio Tinto and the civil war that they recently had with Papua New Guinea. So Bougainville culturally is a part of the Solomon Islands, but it's technically a part of Papua New Guinea. They just recently had a vote, a referendum vote for independence. And while we were there, we got to visit the Panguna mine site. And I think it was quite exceptional to see the mine site being taken over by the jungle again. And to see so many of those dragonflies. Here, I just wanna go back to that. So these dragonflies, if you're not familiar with their life history, they have to live in the water. So as uh, in their larval stage, they are predators in the water. And then as they grow up, they become predators in the sky. But to be a good predator in the water, you need a healthy stream. You need there to be plenty of prey. And those prey need there to be plenty of plants to feed on. And the Panguna mine is, is notorious for a poison, having um, poisoned the land around it. So it's quite exceptional to know that they went through this intense civil war over shutting down the mine. And now you're seeing all of these dragonflies coming back in, all these plants coming back in. And just as equally, you see there's still some tension from that civil war. Um, and it's just sort of in these subtle notes, like on the van that we are taking up to the Panguna mine site. But you see that some of the structures from the mine have been reclaimed and repurposed by the people as well. So this is a school there. And throughout my travels, I always focus on going to see some unique plants, animals, um, particularly the insects. But something I really appreciate learning along the way is how important the history is and how when horrible things like this horrible civil war happened, but which they won. They are making progress. They are making good things out of the rubble. And I found that quite inspiring. And something else that happens quite a lot is when I go to look for insects, I am followed <laughs> and typically by young girls. And they have no idea what I'm doing here. And why I'm wanting to look through the bushes, but they're keen to come and help me out. And I had a lot of fun with these girls. Um, I had shown them some pictures of stick insects and I asked them if they had seen them before and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And stick insects are, are very hard to find, but after many hours, <laughs> we eventually found some in the day. And these I learned um, in their native language is called the one that gives birth to snakes. And when I asked them why, why, like, why is it named that? Where does that come from? What does it mean? They, they didn't really know. But, but after leaving and talking about this with others, someone suggested that it could be a parasitic worm that someone had seen inside of one of these stick insects before. So there are some parasitic worms that will attack uh, phasmids and, and mantids. And then if you immerse them in water, the worm comes out. There's some, that's, there's some YouTube videos that you can explore later <laughs> looking for that. But maybe that's where this name comes from, the one that gives birth to snakes. And I'm not entirely sure, but that's this aspect of the cultural um, perspective of this stick insect that I, I like for my own purposes. I'm curious about the scientific name, but I really enjoy getting to learn their perspective, their local words for these animals. And often they're really unique. Now the peppermint stick insects, you may be familiar with um, up in Cairns. We have Megacrania batesii, which is throughout the Dane tree. You can find some near Innisfail as well. And um, they're typically coastal. They eat pandanus or screw pine. 
and they have this defensive spray which smells quite nice like peppermint. Now pandanus is in many places but the peppermint stick insects are not in every place that the pandanus is. Every island that we visited had plenty of pandanus and so I was constantly looking for this stick insect. Um, and I, I knew that there's many unique species here, including Megacrania nigrosulfuria. So I've included this other photo here so you can compare how different they are from the Megacrania batesii we have in the Dane tree. And this Me uh, Megacrania nigrosulfuria, or the, I guess you could call it the black peppermint stick insect, we don't have a common name. Uh, it's found at 500 meters elevation and it hasn't been collected more recently. So by getting to go to, um, on to these remote places and, and having a ship to be able to do that, we're able to photograph these insects alive and in the wild, whereas we only have really old specimens that have completely discolored and, and possibly um, been broken apart over time. And with a lot of patience, eventually uh, I got to find a peppermint stick insect, which I found was also documented to be in this area back in the 1950s, but no one has really been there since. Um, and this peppermint stick insect, I actually risked my camera because it was pouring down rain to see it and I screamed when I found it. Um, but this is thought to be the same species that we have down in Australia. And I, and there's a lot of speculation as to how the same species, in theory, could be in New Ireland, the north of New Guinea, and all the way down in Australia. And there's some theories floating around that maybe the pandanus clumps, which they live in, float around with a cyclone and get moved to different islands. But that's one of these mysteries that remains. And who knows if this really is uh, the same species that we have here in Australia. I was only able to take photographs while I was there, but I know that if I get to go back, I'm getting permits to do some collections so I can work out these mysteries. And something else I found along uh, in the similar area, so peppermint stick insects were top of my list, dream thing to find, but so is this. And this looks like an ant. It probably looks like nothing. I was shaking when I saw this. And there are some local girls who had followed me and they became, they started to become quite worried. And um, I was able to pull up a, a photo that I had stored on my phone to show them that this is what it turns into. This is a leaf insect of the genus Philium. And uh, after sharing this photo with uh, the phyllidae expert of the world, Royce Cumming, he noticed that the colorations of this nymph so this is a the newly hatched leaf insect here i'll show you this so when they first hatch they look like a little black ant um, that allows them to pull up to their host plant um, where they can then resemble a leaf be perfectly camouflaged as they eat and grow and the females are different from the males uh, the females don't fly they're pretty sedentary they have a larger body which allows them to lay more eggs, whereas the males have very long antennae to sniff out the female and very long wings to fly to her. Um, but when those little hatchlings first come out, they have very unique coloration. And we found that between species, that coloration is unique to that species. And this one has not been documented before. <laughs> so you can imagine how I feel after seeing it, photographing it, and having to leave it behind. I really want to go back. Okay. But that wasn't the best thing. So right after finding that tiny thing, I found this. This may look like a tree lobster, and that's one of the common names. It's also called a giant spiny stick insect. So I was really, really excited about this tiny, tiny new hatchling leaf insect. And then I became over the moon to find this amazing Eurycantha. This uh, stick insect was something I also dreamed. I, I never thought I would find. And this is a, a male. So the females tend to have what is called a long ovipositor. It looks like a long stinger or a long point on the end. 
And when I first found this, I knew it was a male because they have these large spikes on the edge. So I'll show you what they can do with those leg spikes. That's the boy, so the girls are bigger. So he'll do his little leg spikes, boom. <laughs> And the, the males can do that to other males to, to fight. And um, they'll spike each other and stab each other. And some males have been found with puncture wounds. Um, and they'll, they'll do that to access the females. And culturally, these leg spikes have been known to be used as fish hooks as well. And this is such a large stick insect. I, I couldn't help but ask the locals, do you eat it? <laughs> which they, were, they, they, they thought was funny. No, they do not. But they said across the river, so they lived on an island, across the river, they know that people do eat them and that there's many. I only got to see the one. And then they were telling me that the male was even bigger. Now, what they were talking about was actually the female and what they're mistaking for an ovipositor. I can see why they thought it was a male. <laughs> But the females are even bigger. So the males are small um, because they have to fight with each other and they have to access the female. But uh, for a female stick insect, larger, uh, being larger as a female is better because you can lay more eggs. And so I can't imagine getting to see that female of this stick insect. Another thing about this is that once trying to, uh, once I came back and had internet connection, I tried to identify what this was. And I consulted with Paul Brock, who is a, a phasmid expert for this region of the world. And he said, hmm, looks like your Acantha calcarata could be undescribed. What? <laughs> this is such a large insect and it could be undescribed. How exceptional is that? And I think it just goes to show that there's a lot to be seen in, in this world still. Now, when I first saw it, I handle insects quite a lot. I know what will sting me, what will bite me, and what is safe. Um, and so, of course, I held this stick insect. It's spiky, but it's pretty safe. And the locals uh, thought that was a bit absurd. <laughs> but you are, uh, or I felt like I was affording them some free entertainment, and um, I shared it with them. And the funny thing to me is that the boys were absolutely terrified. You can see this little boy's face in the right-hand photo, but the girls, they were ready. They, they could do it. And maybe it's because I was a girl too that they, they were confident enough to do it. Or maybe girls here are just like way more brave than any of the boys. But I thought that was quite exceptional. And I really wish I had more time in these places. Uh, once I came back, I started thinking about how I could compile insect guides and, and how I could compile some more resources. Because when, when we visit these communities, we, we always bring school supplies. Um, a lot of, they have access to food, they have access to some medical care, um, but some small things like school supplies are really hard to access and get in uh, abundance. And so something I was thinking I could contribute is guides to the local insects. But what I saw while I was there was only a small subset of, of what you can find. And so it's, it's my dream to one day go back and, and work with these kids because they, they're brave, they're ready, they're curious. And a lot of, there's a lot of wonderful adults that know a lot about these insects as well. So there's a lot to be found and described, but I think it's really important that as we do that, we should consider the context that these animals are coming from. So both the cultural context and the ecological context. And that's something that really excites me. Um, there's many people I met along this trip and I, I find myself just sort of staring off into space, thinking about this, this month, this, special trip where every day I got to meet new people, both people uh, that were passengers on a ship that I was guiding through the forest and um, teaching them about different plants that I knew, and people that I learned from and got to meet in each community, because I just had so much fun with each of them. And um, I really encourage you, if you get the chance to go to New Guinea, 
there's a lot of wonderful people there to meet, a lot of diverse culture, which I couldn't include in this presentation. Um, and there's a lot of amazing insects that you can find as well. Maybe you'll be converted and you'll be, you'll be mostly looking for the insects and maybe on a side trip, you'll go look for a bird of paradise. <laughs> But there's, there's lots to explore there. There are many amazing plants and plenty of other insects that I couldn't even include in this presentation. So I'd like to thank you for your, your attention and your, your patience and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thanks very much, Jessa, that was fabulous. Thanks.